Greetings folks, it's Professor Fiore back one more time. Today we're going to talk about microphones. How do these little beasties work? What I'm holding in my hand here is the venerable Shure SM58 dynamic microphone, vocalist microphone. Very famous, widely used. There is a slightly different version of this, the 57, which doesn't have the sort of built-in mesh windscreen ball. Right? So we, typically we would use this on instruments and we would use this for vocals. But there are many different kinds of microphones out there. You've probably seen some different kinds, you know, just from looking at various videos and so forth. How do they work? Um, for example, you might see a little pencil like this, right? This is a little AKG condenser microphone. This is another kind of condenser microphone. This is a, a mini shotgun, which I'll talk about in a sec. And it has a little windscreen. You'll see these little foam things that go over here, right? So if you're outside, wind hits the diaphragm in here and can make all kinds of nasty noises. So we put a little windscreen on there. Um, here's another AKG condenser. This is a, uh, a 214. This is what's called a side address. Now, you know, how do these things work? How are they the same? How are they different? You know, what's the deal here? Okay. Well, the first thing I want to say is when you're looking at a dynamic microphone, you know, like one of these kind of guys, the operation is essentially the same as a loudspeaker. So if you haven't looked at the uh, loudspeaker video, you probably want to look at that now and then come back to this. So, you know, in that video, we're talking about, you know, how do you take a you know, a woofer, a tweeter, how do these things uh, function? How do they work? Right? Well, it's all based on Faraday's law, which essentially says if there's a, a conductor, a wire in a magnetic field, and you move it, you can induce a voltage in there. In the case of a loudspeaker, we do the opposite. We, we put a current in the conductor, which creates a magnetic field. Basically, it's like an electromagnet. And that reacts to the fixed magnet at the back of the loudspeaker, and we get motion. You know, if you've ever played with magnets, you know, depending on how you orient them, they're either going to attract or they're going to repel. So that's what happens as the current direction changes, right, from one way to the other, the polarity of that electromagnetic changes, and we either get attraction or repulsion. Turns out you can use a loudspeaker as a microphone. This is basically what a dynamic microphone is. So this thing fundamentally is a lot like this guy. The designs themselves have been skewed, in this case, to produce low frequencies, in this case, to pick up sound. But you could take this, literally, wire this into a little amplifier, speak into it, and you'll get a signal. All right? You can, you can take this thing directly, put this into an oscilloscope, talk into it, and you'll actually see waveforms. All right? Old-fashioned intercoms, you know, push-to-talk intercoms, that's typically what they did. They had one loudspeaker, maybe a little three- or four-inch loudspeaker, and... In one direction, it, it was uh, hooked up like a microphone. In the other direction, it was hooked up as a loudspeaker, right? Can you do the same thing with a mic? Well, theoretically, but they're really designed for pickup. So you're not going to get a very, a very loud output before you destroy the thing. So don't try to use this as a, as a loudspeaker, right? You can experiment the other way with this. Right? You can use this as a mic. You're not going to hurt it. But don't try going the other way, right? The diaphragm in here is uh, very, very lightweight and fragile compared to this diagram, this diaphragm. But it's essentially the same stuff. There's a magnet, there's a voice coil, okay? Um, a, you know, the diaphragm, the surround, the whole thing, it's really all the same, but it's skewed toward picking up sound. That's how a dynamic microphone works. But we also have, you know, these... Condenser mics. So how are they different? Well, they also have a diaphragm. But this essentially operates on a slightly different principle where this very lightweight metallized plastic diaphragm moves with the air pressure or with the sound. And essentially it works kind of like one plate of a capacitor. And uh, you basically, by speaking, make that one plate move, which ultimately will create a voltage right, that goes through a little amplifier. These things need to be powered, unlike dynamic microphones, which are purely passive. You need to have a little internal amplifier for these things. So they'll either come with a little battery like this. This is an electric condenser, as it's called. 
So there's a little battery in here. Or, like this guy, um, this is going to be powered through, uh, you know, the mixing board or your, your audio interface, whatever that is, through something called phantom power. It basically sends 48 volts DC down through the, the audio lines and uses that to drive the internal amplifiers. Okay? So, condenser microphones are usually considered to be um, at least high, you know, the higher and not the little cheapy ones. You can buy real cheap little condenser microphones, you know, hobby kind of things for just a few dollars. But, you know, studio grade microphones are considered to be sort of the upper echelon, highest quality, highest accuracy. And for measurement purposes, we usually use condensers, but they're usually the pencil style, not this, right? This is what's called a side address microphone. So, all right, you know, the basic idea, whether it's a dynamic microphone, you know, with a moving coil or it's a condenser type, and there are others like ribbon microphones, for example, and piezoelectric um, input devices. However it's done, you're going to produce a voltage that's proportional to the sound pressure change. All right. And then, you know, that goes off into your mixing board or, you know, whatever the heck it is, you record the thing or use it for public address, what have you. So however that internal thing works, you know, it works. And that's as far as I'm going to say. How do we quantify the performance of the microphone? Well, you know, one of the things you care about is its sensitivity. So on a spec sheet, you can look up and find out, you know, what sort of voltage you get for a certain SPL, right? So you can compare microphones to each other this way. You can also look for a parameter called self noise. What is the inherent noise of this amplifier? In other words, if it's ideally perfectly quiet, what's the noise floor this thing is producing? Ideally, it would be zero, but you know, it will produce something, okay? One of the really big things we care about is the uh, pickup pattern, right? We also care about you know, how, how large the, the sound pressure level can be before this thing really distorts. But you know, for most applications, unless you're recording something that's insanely loud, um, that's not, that's not right in the front, but this, this idea of the directionality is very, very important. So we come up with omnidirectional microphones, cardioid response microphones, and then certain kinds of directionals that uh, are sort of, you could kind of think of them as sort of variations on cardioid, like supercardioid and hypercardioid, and then something called a figure of eight or dipole. So, you know, what do I mean by all this, right? I'm just throwing words out here. Well, if you could imagine sort of speaking in a microphone. And by side address, what we mean is you're going to speak like this, right? You're going into the side. Whereas, you know, this guy, you're talking into it like this, okay? Direct. Same is true with this pencil, right? The diaphragm is, is literally in parallel with this, right? So you're going like this. But if you take a close look at this, you see the diaphragm is right here. Okay, it's flat on as I'm looking into it. So this is side address. And before I forget, I will add one thing, because everybody always asks about this. What the heck are these things, right? Well, this is just a pop filter. You know, when you speak certain sounds, plosives, P sounds like popcorn, right? Um, when that plosive, when that sort of large expulsion of air hits the diaphragm, you can get these big low frequency excursions, which can create a lot of distortion. So we put these devices in front, it's just a very, simple, fine mesh. In the old days, you know, we used to take pantyhose and put it over, um, you know, a, a, a coat hanger and use that. But basically, pop, 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 you go like that and it gets rid of it, right? So you could, here's a simple test. You can just go like this. Pop, pop. You can feel the air, right, hitting your hand. You put this up in between, pop, pop, pop. you don't feel anything. So that's, that plosive isn't hitting the diaphragm and you're not having that issue. So in any case, right? So here I am speaking in the microphone. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of walk around the microphone and constantly as I'm doing that, record what the sound pressure level is. Now in reality, I'm going to have a controlled source out here and I'll just rotate the microphone itself rather than me walking around it. But that's the basic idea, okay? So I'm going to make a little graph, a little chart all right, so we'll just say this is the front, as I was just holding it, right? These are the sides, here's the back. 
So if something is omnidirectional, what we're going to get is an equal response. These axes would represent a sound pressure level. Right? So, you know, we could imagine having concentric circles here that represent the same sound pressure level. Right? So you could think of this as like 0 dB, right? This outer one. So I'm just going to do this as reference. Maybe that's minus 10, this one's minus 20, minus 30, minus 40, and so on and so forth. All right? So we walk around, like I said, the microphone, or we spin the microphone, however you want to do it, and we see what we get. So up front, we take that as our reference. And then maybe as I go around to the side, all right? So here's my microphone again. So I go around to the side, or in my case, I'll just rotate the microphone. So I'm now like this. Maybe the output isn't as big. As a matter of fact, this particular microphone is called a cardioid microphone, and that would be the case. But it might also be omnidirectional. In other words, no matter where I go around here, I get the same exact signal. So in omnidirectional, as you go around, you would get a, a curve, so to speak. It just goes like this. It's the same wherever you're standing. But a directional microphone, and something that's even more directional, would be like this uh, 58, right? SM58. As you would go around, you would find that that signal is starting to drop off. So maybe, you know, 90 degrees off, right, on either side, maybe this output signal is down by, you know, 6, 8, 10 dB. And then if you stand right behind it, maybe it's down by 25 or 30 dB. So you get something that kind of goes like that, right? And then if you go around the other side, you get this. And this is where that name cardioid comes from, right? Kind of looks like a heart, all right? So that would be a, a typical cardioid response, directional response. Then we have sort of variations on the theme. So I'll just erase this. Other kinds of responses you might get. Right, so I'm just going to put this over here real quick. So you got that nice omni, and you've got this sort of cardioid. Oops. Okay. We could also have a response that's called a supercardioid, or even more so, a hypercardioid where th these lobes kind of come in and there's a little tail in the back. So you get something that's even more directional, like this, but you'll see a little lobe, okay? Almost looks like an apple in this case. But basically, if you were to compare the two, it would be kind of like this. You get this nice directional thing in the front. On, on the sides, it's worse, but you're gonna pay for it because there's this little thing in the back, all right? So the hyper and the super are essentially sort of variations on a theme. Technically, it has to do with the, with the acceptance angle that comes in here, but as far as we're concerned, we'll say they're just sort of cousins. All right. And then we have a dipole or a figure of eight, where if we just imagine this is continuing, right, that tail gets bigger and bigger and bigger until finally we get a response that looks like this. So this thing, Directly in front, you get full signal. Directly behind, you get full signal. On either side, you basically get nothing. All right, so that's either a figure eight or a dipole. So there are certain applications where um, you know, we want to use one versus the other. You know, if you're doing a PA kind of thing, you want to isolate the uh, instruments from the PA, right? You don't want them, to, you don't want the instrument, let's say, uh, uh, a microphone, uh, overhead microphone on a drum kit to pick up the PA because you're going to create some feedback, right? You're going to hear that feedback squeal. You don't want that. So I want to isolate it. If I'm in the studio, uh, you know, I'm doing any kind of recording or PA work for that matter. I want to have a microphone pick up only one thing. I don't want the microphone that's, you know, picking up my snare drum to also pick up, you know, the bass player's cabinet next to me. I only want to get that one thing. So we can kind of focus in on the sound by doing this. You know, in other cases, you know, I do want something that picks up. You know, if I'm, if I'm um, you know, maybe at a meeting or something and I've got a bunch of people speaking, maybe an omnidirectional would be a good choice. I can just put one microphone out there and I can get everybody, all right? Um, 
So there's you know pluses and minuses here. Generally, cardioid types have a, a sort of a side effect called proximity effect that when you get really close to the microphone, okay, so you, you're like eating the microphone like this, it accentuates bass. So you get this very heavy, chesty kind of sound when you get really close to it. And some microphones will have a little switch so that you can attenuate some of the low, low, low frequencies, all right, so that they're not um, as prominent. So, you know, this, this uh, little condenser does, there's a little switch here, you can have a low frequency cut. It also has a built-in attenuator, so if the signal is really loud, you can click down here and, you know, reduce the, the output signal so you don't overload the preamp that's following, all right? So these, these patterns you have to sort of use judiciously. Now, there are some special cases to this. So I mentioned up front, this guy is a short shotgun microphone. This is used to get something that's far away. It's kind of like the, the sonic equivalent in some respects of uh, a telephoto lens. So you can imagine this is kind of having this frontal lobe that's really long and there's really nothing much on the sides. And sometimes uh, shotgun lights, shotgun mics can be really quite long. Um, that is what helps them sort of focus in on the sound. There are some other things you can do. For example, you'll sometimes see at sporting events, a parabolic reflector, you know, um, usually a clear plastic thing with a little handle on it and people point it. Okay. So that's working the same way a dish would work, you know, like a satellite dish. It's the same idea, but with an acoustic rather than electromagnetic signal. So these are all things. So, um, you know, if you're what every now and then you might see on like a late night talk show or something, you might see a microphone pop through the top of the screen like this, right? And it'll disappear. That kind of thing. Because there's a person outside the camera who's got a short shotgun like this on a pole. And they're standing out there and, you know, they're, they're putting that over the guest, let's say, so that they can pick up the guest vocals. Because it's, it's um, you know, maybe a little cumbersome to have everybody you know, sitting there with these little microphones on them. Nowadays, it's not quite as bad as it used to be because, you know, we have really nice, high-quality uh, wireless microphones that we can use. But in the old days, you know, you didn't want your guests to come in dragging a mic cable or have, have them sit down and then have to plug in. So this way, they would just come on stage, they would sit down, you know, the host could talk to them, and then, you know, we would have this little guy. But every now and then, you know, if it's live TV, one of these guys might just burp, go through the top so they have a monitor they're looking at, you know, they can see what's going on and they just try very hard to have this thing just a little bit out of frame, right? So this way they can get the best possible audio, but you don't want to see this thing swinging around, right? Okay. So that's the, that's the sort of intro on our microphones. All right. So to real quick recap, dynamic microphone, dynamic microphones like these guys. Right? They work on Faraday's law. They're basically the same thing, operating backwards to a loudspeaker, a dynamic loudspeaker. Most other microphones, condenser types, there's a similar sort of diaphragm thing going on, but it's a capacitive effect rather than this magnetic thing that's going on. And there are some other types of microphones as well. Ribbon microphones where they use a tensioned ribbon. It's kind of like a normal um, dynamic microphone. Um, it's similar in that regard, but um, like I said, instead of a normal diaphragm, you would have this sort of stretched ribbon. And then there's piezoelectric devices. There are some other more esoteric things out there, but, you know, probably 95% of the mics that you're going to see are either going to be these dynamic microphones. And I must admit, it's not a word I like because, you know, all, all microphones are dynamic. They're all, they all have moving parts. Um, but either it's that sort of moving coil dynamic microphone or it's going to be a condenser. All right. Okay. I think that wraps it up. We'll see you next time.